everybody, welcome back to Witch Fix, and do you remember when I said that A Witch in Winter was kind of refreshing because it kind of steered around that whole Twilight New Moon thing where someone leaves someone for their own good? That may have been incredibly premature of me because I've just read the sequel, A Witch in Love, and it kind of falls back into, shall we say, old habits. And while I don't think the first book was necessarily deserving of being slated as a Twilight clone, the second book kind of leans more heavily into that, so um, that, that's a little bit worrying. Also, I bought all three of these, I think, on eBay together from the same person, and while the first two books have been read, the third one was not, so we'll, we'll see why that was, but um, hopefully they didn't find this book too off-putting, because there was a lot in it that I did really enjoy. And this book is A Witch in Love by Ruth Warburton, part two of the Witch in Winter series. Basically, the blurb is the same as on the first book. It's all about whether you can trust love, which was begun in magic. But they kind of bring that back as like a plot point, which, to be honest, I felt like we'd gotten past that in the first book. So it felt like a little bit of regression. Also, Anna's character seems to have regressed a little bit because she seems to be far more stupid than she was in the first book. But um, we'll get into the plot and beware spoilers because we will we'll be talking spoilers. And there will be mentions of, like, drugging and imprisonment in this, although, like, no sexual assault or anything like that. So we start off the book, I think, about six months after the first one, which ended, obviously, in that climantic battle. Climantic? Climactic battle against the Witch Council, whose name I can't pronounce. And it, everything seems to be fine now, except that Anna has, since the first book, decided to completely repress her magic. Which is weird, because there was no sign that she was going to do that really in the first book that I could see. She seemed to be uh, kind of at peace with her powers by the end of it, because she had used them so well to defend people that she cared about. But start of this book, she is repressing them, refusing to do any magic. And unfortunately, it is leaking out to odd moments when she is emotionally stimulated. So, for example, when she and Seth are trying to get it on, and also when they are attacked in an alleyway while coming home from dinner, and she accidentally kind of blows up at two would-be muggers, knocking both of them unconscious. And she feels really bad about it it and thinks of her magic as being quite evil but then Seth raises a good point would she be panicking like this if she just whacked them with a rock and knocked them unconscious just because she used magic to do it doesn't necessarily make it any less self-defense so kind of with Seth on that one uh, Anna then decides to take a trip up to London with best friend Emmeline that they're now best friends I don't know why but they go up there and end up visiting Anna's old house and when they're there Emmeline gets a really strong sense that there is something magical and sure enough they do discover a charm buried underneath Anna's front doorstep which feels malign it feels like deadening to, to magic uh, and they're a little bit concerned about why that's there so they take it home to Emmeline's mum who looks at it and in looking it over and looking at the parchment pieces inside it, it looks like a spell that was performed on Anna herself, that as long as she called that place home, her magic would be bound, uh, which is why when she kind of went back there and started feeling all those homely feelings, she wasn't able to do any magic. I think that's quite a cool explanation because, like, obviously... There's, there'd be a loophole if it was just as long as she's there, you know, she could have gone on holiday, she could have gone other places, but it's as long as she thought of that place as home. It kind of is a bit like the Harry Potter thing, like as long as he called Privet Drive home, he'd be protected or something. It's been so long since I read those books, but it, it's kind of interesting. And also that there is a spell on her dad to stop him from talking about her mum, which she kind of discovered in the last book because he seemed unable to talk about her but this time she actually senses it on him and, and knows that that has occurred so essentially it looks like Anna's mum did this before running away and Anna gratifyingly catches on to this fairly quickly that her mum bound her powers cast like a hiding spell over the whole house and forced her dad never to talk about her all to keep Anna ignorant of the fact that she was a witch and to keep her safe which kind of begs the question, what was she running from? And are we going to see Anna's mum come back? Because people keep tripping all over themselves to say, oh yeah, she's missing and definitely presumed dead. But you know what they say when you presume. Back in winter, Anna begins to notice some unusual activity around the house. Footprints circling the house in the snow, etc, etc. And then a message is left painted on the wall, which is like a biblical reference. I think it's like Dute and then some numbers. So it's like Deuteronomy. 
and it's all about witches. And she gets told by Emmeline that there is a human organisation called the Malleus Maleficorum, which is Malleus Maleficorum with an O, who still follow the book of the Malleus Maleficorum, still hunt witches just underground, and they compare it to the clan. Uh, but, you know, attacking witches uh, when the laws changed to spare people who were suspected of witchcraft. They talk a little bit about the witch trials and how basically not very many witches were actually caught and executed during those times. It was just innocent people. Uh, but they do raise interesting points about how, like, obviously during the trial, the witches were like exhausted and starved and they couldn't use their magic during that time because their bodies were too... Um, deprived of, of vital nutrients and rest which kind of heads off at the past another loophole where you could have been like yeah but if they actually caught a witch how would they ever capture her well now we know how the weird message in the Mal malleus maleficorum get kind of forgotten about when dad drops a bombshell on anna it reaches her 18th birthday which is before the date that she has always thought of as her birthday due to her mother apparently making a mistake on some paperwork basically hiding her true date of birth and on her 18th birthday the spell on her dad appears to have been lifted and he gives her a letter from her mother uh, to tell her some things and her mother has basically left just a kind of rambly goodbye note which doesn't really tell us anything except that you know she's sad to go and all that other stuff and that she's probably dead which i don't think she is but it also contains a passport sized photograph of her mother Please remember that it's passport sized. We'll get back to that in a second. But written on it in teeny tiny writing that you need to be a witch to be able to see is a message from her mother that says, basically, if you can see this, it means you're a witch. And I'm very sorry because there was obviously a chance that Anna was going to come out human and everything would be fine. But now her mother is warning her to be careful who she trusts and who she loves. So obviously a dire warning. Now, this is where I had my first, like, what the fuck moment for the book, because on page 153, Anna takes a closer look at this passport-sized photograph and says that she can see um, mirror writing in it, so the, the writing on the shop window in the shop that the photo was taken in. And when she looks at it in a mirror, she can tell what it says from the inside and can read the entire name of the shop, which is True Love Books Soho. In a passport size picture where most of the space is going to be taken up by her mum's fat head, in like the, the, the half centimetre gaps around that image in a picture, she can see the entire full name and location of this bookshop. I would have thought maybe she can see some books, she can see maybe the beginning of the word true love and then the end of the word Soho, maybe she can work out from that. But no, it says that she can see the full name. It says True Love Books Soho that she's reading from this thing. And I was like, OK, my fragility has been stretched. But you know what? I will let that go. I will just forget that that happened and just ignore it. I'm not going to let it ruin the book. But then on page 164, uh, she takes the, the photograph to Emmeline to show her. And apparently, using a magnifying glass, you can just make out the words Proprietor Caradoc True Love underneath the shop name. So you can see the very long shop name and then the very long line of text telling you who the proprietor is. In a passport-sized photo, where apparently her mum being in the foreground doesn't cut off any of the letters that you can see in the background on the window, and also somehow magically you can read them because they're not itty bitty teeny tiny. I mean, even with a magnifying glass, her mum should still be standing in front of some of it, surely. But there we go, that annoyed me. <laughs> and it just irritated me a little bit. But th then we get into like kind of the core of the plot because in search of this bookshop where her mum was photographed, Anna decides to take another trip to London with Emmeline so they go up there. They go to the bookshop, there's some magic stuff, they get to speak to the proprietor in some sort of special alternate magic realm behind the actual bookshop that humans can visit and he tells her that her mother was basically paranoid and panicked that she was disowned by her family for daring to marry a human that she basically gave up being a witch that she moved away with Anna's dad but that she returned to visit Caradoc when she was pregnant and was terrified that she was being followed that people were after her and that she desperately needed protection and that then she disappeared while he was asleep and he never saw her again 
and that he believes her to be dead. And to be honest, the amount of people believing this woman to be dead is just convincing me more that she is not actually dead. So he says all that and then he says that he can get in touch with Anna's maternal grandmother, her grandfather having passed away, but her grandmother still being alive. And Anna instantly agrees. She's like, call her. I want to speak to her. Which is my second gripe with the book is that Anna is suddenly dumb because her mother obviously split from her family. Her family were very down on her being with a human. And yet it doesn't even occur to Anna that her grandmother might be the person that her mother was running from in the first place. And that just walking up to her, the minute all these magical protections get negated by Anna turning 18, it might be just what her mother was afraid of. She doesn't even think this through. She's just like, nope, I want to speak to my grandma. And then grandma is duly summoned and they go out to have tea at a fancy hotel. And grandma is red flags from the get-go. She's very fancy. She has like this very cool and calm demeanour. Um, she instantly kind of put me in mind of someone who might be very controlling and very devious. Uh, just from the way that she's described and the way she talks about how unfortunate it was that Anna's mother ran away from them. And she kind of puts some of the blame on Anna's mum and, and seems to be trying to maybe twist history a little bit in her favour. She then has to go to an urgent meeting, but gives Anna a card with the address of her office on it and says, meet me there in a couple of hours and we'll have dinner. Um, so Anna's like, cool. And then her grandma disappears. And Anna looks at the card and sees that it has like a, a crow on it and is like, huh, this looks familiar. And then can't figure out where it looks familiar from. As if in the previous book, she wasn't like haunted by crows the whole time, then attacked by one at the end and also presented with a similarly marked card by one of the bad guys from the witch council who tried to murder her and her family and did successfully kill one of her new friends. So she just she just doesn't see these red flags. Further red flags are raised when her grandmother has left like clothes and stuff for her to wear when Anna finally reaches the office, which is magically hidden. Like she has to jump off a bridge into the river to reach it. Uh, she's given like fancy clothes to wear to go to this fancy dinner and goes through like the offices, which she says look kind of um, ministerial, a little bit parliamentary. And, you know, everyone's using magic every which way. Um, so it seems like the polar opposite of Maya and all the good witches that we know about to be using this much magic on things that could be accomplished by mundane human means. We're told that the entrance is hidden there because there's like magic powering it, which is drawn from the hidden rivers and where they meet, which is something I'll call back to later. But Anna sits down to dinner with her grandmother, who immediately begins questioning her about her levels of magical competence, magical powers, how how her training's going. It feels very much like what the council was talking to her about, you know, you can achieve great things, join us, all that stuff. And then a woman comes over to talk to her grandmother, and after they've been talking for a bit, Anna suddenly realises that this was one of the three members of the Witch Council who came to threaten her, like, in person, six months ago. I don't think I would ever forget those faces. I don't think it would take me more than a second to recognise them. But it takes Anna a while, and then when she does, she flips out. She demands to leave, she starts panicking that she's been trapped, and she has kind of let herself be trapped by being stupid. Uh, her grandmother gives her directions to leave and Anna stumbles around getting lost until a guy called Marcus, who we know his name now, so I'm guessing he's going to be a returning character, uh, helps her to leave and escape. And she gets all the way back home in this evening dress, but she's freezing cold. She gets picked up by Seth and has just had a terrible time and never wants to see her grandmother again. Unfortunately, the unpleasant shocks don't stop there because when she returns home, it seems that the Malleus Maleficorum have been active in her absence and have tried to burn down her house. They've mostly just torched an outbuilding and the kitchen is now burned down as well. Um, so the damage isn't too severe, but it's enough to like worry her a little bit and she has to go spend the night at Seth's house with her dad. We get some feedback about Seth's granddad, who still doesn't like her very much. He has really stepped up his campaign of not liking her very much 
uh, and that's mentioned a couple of times that he is not very well he seems to have had some sort of stroke or heart attack but every time he sees Anna he starts calling her a witch and screaming at her and all the rest of it so it's not good because the grandfather is so unwell Seth takes Anna to his little house on this island in the bay to get some of his personal stuff because he's going to be leaving hospital and staying with Seth while there they discover in a lockbox of his like personal papers a black hood with eyes cut out and a badge with a double m on it implying that he's a member of Malleus Maleficorum and Seth tries on the hood as a joke because he doesn't really know what it's like and Anna just starts screaming like she has some sort of weird genetically imprinted memory that this hood is evil which I didn't really get but you know whatever after telling Seth about Malleus Maleficorum he destroys um, the badge he like stamps on it a bunch and throws the hood away so he's pretty disgusted by whatever his granddad was involved in Anna's grandmother apparently now knows where Anna lives though so she does make uh, a sort of reappearance via posting Anna's uh, other clothes that she was wearing when they originally met down to her having had them like dry cleaned etc sends along a, lo a load of designer clothes as well and has it posted to Anna care of her school uh, with a long letter explaining that it was another member of the council who was actually responsible for all the violence last year and that she is not defending his actions and she understands Anna's feelings, but she wants Anna to help testify against him to finally get this like draconian man removed from the council. I do not buy this. I think that one member of the council is going to share quite a lot of their beliefs and ideals with other members and that even if her grandmother isn't going to like attack Anna, she is still going to try and manipulate her for this special power that Anna has that we don't know what it is yet so I don't trust the grandma. Anna receives a mysterious email saying the date uh, of the time that she attacked those two muggers uh, which says we know so clearly the Malleus Maleficorum are aware of some of her activities they're gunning for her it's not until she finds a message basically the same message on a piece of paper tucked into her bed that she freaks out and contacts her grandmother to say look I'm in trouble and I need you to help me learn magic so she makes arrangements to go and stay with her grandmother for a week during half term to learn some magic and to learn how to defend herself and uh, I thought that was where the rest of the book was going to happen but she never actually makes it uh, what actually happens is that she kind of fools her dad into leaving a day early so she can spend the night with Seth on Valentine's Day this does not go well. Uh, for starters, her and Seth are going to, you know, seal the deal and, and get together. Um, but then he says he loves her and she is unable to say that she believes him because still in the back of her mind, there's all this nonsense about how, you know, this might be still the spell, even though we know it's not. Seth gets frustrated that she won't believe him and storms off and says, you know, they're through and he needs to leave. Uh, so Anna's upset, she goes to bed and is woken in the night when someone shoves a bag over her head and kidnaps her. The exciting climax of the book is then Anna's trial for being a witch and I had kind of an issue with this as well because I, while I bought that the Malleus Maleficorum would know about her activities, maybe if they had like operatives in the village like watching because they already know that Emmeline and her family live there but as long as their activities are like not against any humans they they have like a code where they can't like attack them that they might have seen some of the stuff she was doing at the trial they bring forth like human witnesses so the two guys who were like magically bamboozled uh, by Anna okay maybe they could have hunted them down at a hospital and made them testify but it seems like these guys aren't worried enough that they are in a court of witch hunters um a, a secret location it just feels like there's too much cooperation between normal human beings who don't believe in witches and the crazy witch hunter guys. And to top it all off, somehow this trial was set into motion when Seth's ex-girlfriend Caroline told the witch hunters that uh, Anna had bewitched him. So somehow this secret organisation of witch hunters is keyed into like the local populace enough that the local populace, even teenage girls, are aware of them and know how to contact them. It made very little sense to me, but we have the trial. Predictably, Anna isn't really allowed to say a lot in her own defence. And we get some chapters where she's like trapped in a cell wearing a scold's bridle and she can't escape because they keep drugging her so she can't use magic. 
Suddenly, the trial, Seth shows up to testify against her, and this absolutely breaks her heart, even though it's kind of obvious that this is a manoeuvre to gain her freedom. When he comes to her and is like, oh, I want to get my ring back off her before you, you know, burn her at the stake, he injects her with a mysterious substance, which gives her all of her magic powers back, and then some, and she causes a giant storm, which I guess kills or incapacitates everyone who's there, uh, and her and Seth are able to fly to safety before she passes out. It's revealed that this mysterious jollop was something that had been extracted from Abe that he had volunteered, because through a very dangerous process that can kill both the donor and the recipient, pure magic can be extracted from one person and injected into a compatible person to give them a power boost. Uh, so we're kind of, again, toying with that whole love triangle thing, and Abe basically admits that he loves her at the end of the book, even though he is over 20 and she is just turned 18, and honestly, that's all kinds of fucked up and weird. I'm not going to get too hit up about it because I feel like he's solidly the Jacob in this Twilight scenario, and he's never going to really be in with a chance. Now, everything seems like it's kind of gone back to normal, all's rosy and well, but then at the end of the book, Seth drops a bombshell in that he thinks that while he's there, Anna is repressing her magic, she can't get control of her emotions, he's causing her a lot of problems and distress, and also doesn't want to be in a relationship with someone who thinks that he's under a spell. So he is still going, and he's taking a boat that he's been working on to Morocco, for the guy who's like owns the boat and who he's doing it up for and that as far as he's concerned they are done and this breaks poor little Anna's heart and that's basically where we leave her in the book with her deciding to focus her energies instead on trying to track down her mum or find out what happened to her which honestly I feel like that could have come a little bit sooner and doesn't necessarily require a broken heart for her to do but whatever whatever gets you there, Anna. Uh, so I guess that's what the third book is going to be about, a witch alone. She's without Seth and is going to try and, you know, find out what happened to her mum and what her secret power is and all the rest of these unsolved mysteries. But I'm concerned that while Seth is away, Abe is going to be featured more in the books. And to be honest, I find him like creepy and weird. There's just something about him, like, at one point he, like, hugs her, and it's described as, like, he presses his belt buckle really hard into her pelvis when they're hugging. He gives me massive r slash nice guys vibes, and I'm not a fan of Abe, so I really hope he's not around. Uh, but there we go, that was the second book. I said, like, I liked the first one. This one I liked a little bit less because it felt like the plot relied in some places on Anna being unusually stupid and not recognising things as quickly as she should have, and not being able to get herself out of tough situations. Like, I kind of get, like, when she was kidnapped, she could, like, magic her way out of that, and that's fine. But it feels like she, she didn't really do enough to help herself, this book, and it, it kind of annoyed me. Also, the just the weird thing about the photograph just put me on edge, because it seemed, it's such a small thing, and yet, it was such a mind-boggling ask to get me to believe that she had seen that. And there are so many ways in which that could have been worked in a little bit more gracefully. It would have just required her to do a little bit of research and not just see the, the name of the place in this tiny, tiny, tiny photograph. So, so that kind of irritated me, although that's not really my big irritation. Anna was a, a little bit dumb. And, and also, she got worried about the, the Manius Maleficorum only after they left a note in her bed and not when they tried to burn down her fucking house. So it felt like events had maybe been put the wrong way round. Maybe it would have been better if she came back from London, found the note in her bed, and then wasn't scared enough to call in her grandmother for help until they actually made an attack on the house. I feel like that would have made more sense. Um, but these are just like niggly little things and the kind of Twilight New Moonish direction of the plot didn't really help with my enjoyment. But it was a pretty solid book. I, I enjoyed the plots-ish. Um, I liked that she's now obviously developing her magic a little bit more. I'm really excited to get to the next book and find out what her big power is and why it's so important. I'm really hoping that she doesn't have the power to just negate other people's powers. Because if it goes like full Twilight arc, then I'm I'm not going to be happy. 
but I'm excited to get to it and I'm going to get to it soon. I apologise, uh, I get the sense that people aren't really enjoying the, the private series reviews. I'm not really sure there's much I can do about that. They are already recorded, I have already finished them and because of a lack of content in other things they are going to be posted like alternately with these ones. I think by the time this review goes out you know it, it should be nearly finished but yeah I'm sorry if you're not enjoying those as much but because of other pressures on my time which I will be able to tell you guys about eventually just not right now um I don't really have the time to like get other content ready and edited and done so I'm really sorry but it won't happen again and I will only be looking at witchy books I just thought it was like a fun thing to do so with that in mind I'll see you for the next review and hopefully we'll be getting to the bottom of the witches in winter series and uh, find out what all the hype was about and if I'm incredibly disappointed by it or not uh, but in the meantime I'll see you in the next one